This is a Max for Live device called Note Triggered Modulator. And the idea here is that it's an eight step or up to eight step uh, parameter sequencer. And it sends up to eight arbitrary values between zero and 127 to up to eight mappable parameters. And it uses the same mapping and range mechanism that's used in devices like the LFO, which maybe you're already familiar with. So the idea with these kinds of devices is that you click the map button, and then you click some parameter somewhere in live, and then you've created a lock for this parameter. Uh, what's interesting about the note triggered modulator is that it's a sequencer, but it's not driven by a clock. It's driven by note input. So every time a note is played, the sequence sends out the current value, scaled appropriately for the all of the parameters that it's mapped to, and then advances to the next step. So now that we've created a mapping between uh, the device and the filter in this wavetable, as we play notes, you'll see that we advance a step and then the filter frequency snaps to the scaled value uh, of the sequencer at that moment. And we can reverse the scaling as well or scale it in a different way. So just like in the LFO, we could make this go backwards. And also like the LFO, we have some controls for offset which tilts everything to the right or left. So all the values get, uh, get an addition or subtraction to them. Which in this case is countered by the fact that we're inverting the scaling. We also have a depth control, which just sort of reduces the amount of modulation being sent out. And unlike something like an LFO, when depth is at zero here, we're always just sending a value of zero. So maybe another interesting thing here is that right now the, the whole concept of the sequencer is that we snap immediately from one value to the other, but there's also a glide parameter. So we can add up to 255 milliseconds of delay. Delay is the wrong word. It's a glide time, essentially, from the previous value to the next value. And we can drive this, of course, by a clip. So if we play a clip full of notes, we advance the sequencer automatically. What's important to note is that the value is sent before the MIDI note is sent. Uh, so we can also use this to modulate things like um, MIDI effects. And we can be sure that the MIDI effect will be, the MIDI effects value will be altered before the note is sent to the corresponding instrument. So if we play a sequence now, And we can adjust these values as the sequence plays as well. And maybe here it's easier to hear what's happening with glide and offset. So important to note upfront that this is not a radically original idea. Uh, this device, I took some, some ideas from two existing devices that are in the Max for Live library. One is called Note Trigger Step Sequencer by Probentius, and the other is called Note Trigger Parameter Step Sequencer by D. Fodal. And both of these devices are great and uh, inspired, as you can see from the design, a lot of the, the concept behind uh, my device. There are a couple things I wanted to do with my device though, which aren't possible with other devices that I could find. Maybe the most uh, important one to me was that I wanted to be able to enable or disable steps uh, arbitrarily. So the buttons that you see above each of the steps 
can turn the corresponding step on or off. And so what you can end up with here is a sequence of steps which repeats at a rate that is independent of the notes that are coming in. So as I feed this sequence into this device now and start turning steps on and off, you can hear that the parameter sequence is changing length, even though the note sequence is not. Okay, so if you've played with other devices that I've made before, you know that this kind of th these kinds of polymetric concepts uh, and advancing sequencers in a tr in a note triggered way are sort of important to the to a lot of the devices that I make. One thing I borrowed from another one of my devices is this notion of um, clock based resetting. So as you're playing through the sequence, for example, you can manually reset to the beginning of the sequence. So if I play notes manually, and then decide I want to jump back to the beginning now, I can press reset now, and then the next step that I play will be the first one. But I can also have this triggered uh, by clock values. So for example, if I want to repeat this pattern every two bars at the current in the current meter, I can specify that I want this to repeat every two bars. And then even though it's a pattern that's five uh, events long, it will jump back to the beginning every two bars of the pattern. So let's listen to how this works. And it's also set to reset when the transport stops. So as soon as the transport stops, it automatically jumps back. This is also toggleable. I, I tend to leave it on all the time because I, I generally always want the pattern to start over uh, after I've stopped the transport, but this is also an option. But you can get some interesting things here because not only is the sequence uh, does the sequence have an independent length, but you can also reset in places that are disjunct from that length. So maybe instead of every two bars, I want to reset this every seven sixteenth notes, despite the fact that the pattern is five sixteenth notes or five events long. Or maybe 11 sixteenth notes, for example. So there's kind of no limit to um, the sorts of rhythmic games you can play with a device like this. Maybe another interesting thing that you might do with it is uh, you could stick it on another track entirely. So if I move it to a track that has in it a different rhythm, then this rhythm will be the pattern that triggers the, um, the track that we hear. Let's turn off our resetter now. By setting this back to zero anything, it's disabled. Maybe that's too strange a pattern. So there's no need to have the events that are uh, triggering the device be the same as the events that you hear. And in this way, you can end up with pretty interesting sort of decouplings. Maybe this is more audible if we play something slow, like a slow chord progression. And we might change the rhythm of this as well. So let's change our grid back to 16th notes. Or maybe we want it to repeat every 16th again.
or simply add some space to make it twice as slow. So that can be kind of fun too. Um, it's an interesting way to, uh, to think about creating variation with this. Another interesting thing that you might think about doing with this is using more than one. So although you can map up to eight parameters per instance of the device, each of those eight parameters will be triggered by the same sequence of values, scaled appropriately for that parameter. But you might want another range of uh, parameter values and or a different number of steps. So here's an example. Um, I'm going to load a second instance of the device, and I'm going to use it to modulate a MIDI pitch effect. So what I want to have happen here is just uh, maybe to alternate between the original pitch value and one an octave higher. So we have to constrain 128 steps to uh, a different scaling of values here. So let's just make this so that it's automatically always going to be at 50% uh, or higher, and then we'll map this to pitch. And what we're going to do is play a sequence that's just a continuous pattern of notes. But just to, to test it to begin with, we'll play some notes by hand. So we're triggering the first modulator here to control filter, and we'll use the second one to control pitch. And instead of 16, we'll set this to 12. So the notes alternate back and forth between being played at their original pitch and being played an octave higher. But we still have this cycling pattern of five events that's triggering the filter. And let's actually just turn this one off for a second so we can listen to some interesting things that we can do with the second modulator. So I'll play a pattern of continuous sixteenths, which we'll hear like this, and then we'll turn this on. And then maybe we can add additional values here at different levels. And then we'll turn the five-step one on again. So that's a pretty interesting case. We've got two different patterns cycling here. Um, we could continue to modulate other parameters with one or both of these modulators, but they're doing very different things. This one is cycling through a larger range of values and a, num a larger number of cycles for a parameter, uh, for a filter frequency parameter. And this is a smaller number of cycles with a more constrained range modulating a MIDI pitch effect. Maybe another way that this uh, this notion of using two of the device can be kind of interesting would be for something like uh, voice alternation. So here in the rack, I have four separate tracks set up. The one we've been listening to, this wavetable, another wavetable, a couple operators or something. And here, if we map to the chain selector, each note will shift to the next chain. So let's set this to, sorry, to two and to three. And now every incoming note will advance to the next chain in the group. What else we can do with this is kind of interesting. We could enable um, silent steps by enabling uh, an additional steps here that assign this chain selector to a chain that doesn't contain anything. Or we could make it bounce back. We could change the pattern in another way. So instead of strictly alternating the steps, we could say maybe 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 0. And 
then we enabled another one that triggers a non-existent step. We could also do something like this to an audio effect rack. So I've built an audio effect rack here with a collection of separate effects, each of which is on a different chain. Of course, we could put multiple effects on a single chain if we wanted to, as well as one dry chain. And we could assign this note triggered modulator to step through each of those audio effect chain, uh, chains in the audio effect rack in turn. Let's see. Ah, oh, we have to map it first. Hold on. Or maybe we could do both. We could also map another one of these to the chain selector in the instrument rack. So we're modulating this, the instrument racks chain selector using this four step version and the note triggered modulator using this seven step version. And of course these could be reset maybe every two bars again so that the pattern doesn't continue indefinitely. Let's make this a little bit simpler. We'll go back to our original setup. And another thing we might do is modulate one of the note triggered modulators controls with another one. So for example, So this is interesting because every once in a while this value will be in a very different place than it is at other parts of the modulation. But we can change that as well. We could say we want one low value, one mid value, and one high value, and these are cycling in a pattern of three. So this is another way that we might end up adding an additional layer of somewhat unpredictable variation to the original pattern. So here we have a filter frequency that's being modulated every five steps, but the second step is itself being modulated in a pattern of three. Sorry, we had low offset, so it wasn't quite as noticeable. Maybe it will be more now. And of course, all of these controls, the on-off controls, the overall depth and offset, and each of the individual controls for the modulation steps itself can be automated or MIDI mapped, etc. So I hope you find this device interesting, and uh, I'd love to hear what you do with it.